tonight, we're hoping, my hope to get from this conversation is to, uh, to offer possibilities or to take a look at uh, three different cases in the sense of uh, Portugal and its dec decrimin decriminalization, Canada and its legalization, and uh, Spain, which I know a good bit about Spain and the, and the club situation in, in Spain, which is still technically an illegal situation. But uh, so we want to kind of get a, get pe give people a flavor of uh, why, you know, why, how these different models worked, how they came about, how they, was there a transition period and look at the pros and cons and the successes and failures of each model. So that's my hope uh, for tonight. And uh, I'm delighted, I'm delighted to welcome, Laura, I'm gonna introduce you. So Miriam, I think Laura has to head off maybe a bit earlier. And so we'll, we'll, we'll go to Portugal first and, uh, and uh, we'll, de we'll deal with that. Uh, to introduce Laura, Laura is uh, Miss Medical Cannabis Conference. She's been behind uh, the, the biggest medical, conf medical cannabis conference in Portugal for the last couple of years. Can I have the name, Laura, of the conference? Uh, it's a PTMC, Portugal Medical Cannabis. There you go. And, uh, and you've been around uh, the situation for the, since the change in law happened there, which is quite a while ago now, 10 years. Are, are, you, are you around that long? Don't look at uh, No, I started working with medical cannabis in uh, 2017. So it's uh, about four years now, more or less. Right. And also a reporter for uh, Canna Reporter is the name of the... Yes. Actually, I, a... I'm a journalist. My education is as a journalist. Right. And um, I, I started organizing conferences because when I, reali when, I, when I realized there was this lack of information about uh, cannabis in general and the media in Portugal, usually when they write news about cannabis, they are all misleading and very confusing and with a lot of prejudice. So I wanted to do uh, things in a different way. Uh, with more information, more reliable information, because the, it, it was like misinformation what we had, and we still have, unfortunately, here in Portugal, in the mainstream media. So, um, but at the time, I realized that it was maybe more important. Um, we were about to legalize uh, the medical cannabis, and I thought that maybe it was more important to bring doctors and researchers to explain to health professionals how things were uh, with medical cannabis because they have no idea at all. So that's why I started organizing these conferences. And then later uh, we created the Cana Reporter, the news website. Right, great stuff. And they're all, I think uh, they're all sentiments that we can absolutely share in Ireland. Uh, our, main, our mainstream media is very guilty of being bought into a narrative which hasn't changed in many, many years. And it's quite a negative narrative, to be honest. And mm. so what has, what's, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, how it's worked out in Portugal? I mean, has this been the great success that it's kind of talked about in Ireland? We took, everybody kind of looks towards Portugal. It's been 10 years of decriminalization. Has it been good? Has it? It's been tw 20 years, actually. It was uh, back in 2001 that Portugal decided to decriminalize all drugs. Uh, and it, that was a big, big step because we were suffering a lot with uh, addiction and HIV um, and people that were on the streets getting like injecting drugs. And by that time, the government decided to decriminalize the drugs and tr uh, started treating the addicted people as uh, uh, sick people. So they started um, uh, these vans that they go to the neighborhoods uh, where the consumption is higher and they bring methadone uh, so they would, wouldn't consume heroin. And that was a, a big step, but 20 years after, uh, people are complaining about some things that didn't work quite as expected. And also what happened is that, uh, you know, like the, the um, heroin addicted, they started being seen as a, 
uh, sick people that needed help and support. But the cannabis users, they are still uh, seen as like uh, drug addicts, which is a little bit of a paradox, you know, because we respect a lot these people that have problems with addiction. We have programs to support them. But when it concerns to cannabis users, we still have a lot of prejudice. And that's a, a little bit confusing for everyone. That's why I think we still we are still not uh, evolving in the cannabis situation here in Portugal because people, they still think that cannabis is a very dangerous drug. And the same person that was responsible for the decriminalization is the same person that two weeks ago, uh, when presenting the, the drug report to the government, he said that it's too soon to legalize cannabis in Portugal because uh, we need to be careful. It's a dangerous drug. So I think we have a little bit of a paradox here in Portugal because at the same time we were so ahead to decriminalize um, heroin and cocaine and all the drugs. And then with cannabis, we are far behind. So something needs to change here. It's that's what really, I think. Yeah, sad thing. It's really extraordinary that that's the situation. So how does it manifest itself? I mean, how do people, uh, where is cannabis available to people? Is it all black market? Everything, yes. Right now, everything at the black market still, and many people grow at home, even though it's illegal. Uh, it's illegal but, as well. Yes, it's illegal to grow, it's illegal. I mean, the, um, it, it's again a paradox. It's, it's not a crime that you consume uh, cannabis, but it's a crime that you buy or that you sell. So where do you get it? It's, it's not like magic, you know, so um, we don't understand really these, uh, these laws because you don't get criminalized for consumption. You can, I mean, if the police sees you smoking on the streets, it's not a big deal. You don't go to jail. Uh, maybe you go to, you go to these um, centers. They created these centers. They call it to, um, uh, uh, Dissuasion, it's to making you giving up of consuming drugs. There is a psychologist there, there is a doctor there, and they take you to this center to tell you, listen, you need to stop consuming drugs. Uh, otherwise, if you don't want to go to these centers, you can pay like a fine of 300 euros, uh, and that's it. But it's rare to, that this happen. So, I mean, it's a... It's like, a, it's very weird here in Portugal because now with medical cannabis that is legal, uh, CBD, it's, um, it's uh, on Infarmed, which is the medicines authorities. It means that CBD is not free for consumption. Like in the UK that is sold in the pharmacies, you can find CBD in stores. In Portugal, it should be, as the law is written, CBD should be only uh, uh, approved by the medicines authority. And at this point, nothing was approved. No CBD product, products were approved. But at the same time, you have now more than 70 stores like cannabis store Amsterdam in Portugal that sell CBD. So this is very, people get confused, you know, like patients, they are always uh, asking, um, but CBD is legal because I saw it uh, in a store. And it's true because uh, the stores are selling CBD, but this CBD on the bottle, the label says that it's not for human consumption. It's only a souvenir or it's only for IND, uh, for research. So it's a very, very confusing situation here in Portugal right now. That's what's happening at the moment. Why is it so complex? It's incredible, huh? this, uh, this plant and everything around it. And so the, uh, well, the most kind of uh, the standout thing there for me is that your kind of cannabis user is somehow still stigmatized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 completely. That's what I was saying. Like you look at um, 
heroin uh, addicted and like you kind of feel people kind of feel sorry oh he's sick because he's addicted um and then when people look at a cannabis user uh, is a drug addict you know <laughs> almost feel like a cannabis user is uh is, is more dangerous or uh, than than uh, an heroin, heroin user. addict yeah so that's certainly not a, a major win for uh, Portuguese decriminalization, is it? Well, it, it, it's good. And in Portugal, is, you know, many countries and many commissions from other countries come to Portugal to visit these units. And um, in Lisbon, it's about to open the first uh, unit where uh, the addicted can go to, to inject drugs assisted by health professionals, you know? Um, right. So um, it, it brought good things because I think we are ahead at this point. I think that uh, every uh, people that is addicted deserve like the, that, they had this uh, kind of support instead of like injecting drugs in uh, under the bridge or uh, somewhere else. Um, but at the same time, they they feel that uh, this is not enough for them because at the same time they are they are getting like these pills like diazepam and these other drugs. So they stay addicted the same. They are not addicted to heroin, but they are addicted to pills. So, I mean, uh, I'm not very, very inside this, uh, how this happened, but uh, I know it's something like this. Wow. Yeah. So, and your, what was your impression? You, you know a good bit about uh, the different situations around Europe. What would be your feeling about uh, how does Portugal compare in terms of what's possible out there? Um, you mean for the legalization? Yeah, like you have, we have different situations within Europe, you know, I mean, next door in Spain, you have, mm -hmm. uh, you have the right to grow and you have the clubs that are collective grows. And uh, so that's a kind of way that the that Spanish have, have cheated uh, mm -hmm. not dealing, have, not, have decided not to deal with the complex issues of these laws that we're talking about and they've kind of gone with uh, uh, what is a kind of, uh, what they perceive as a kind of traditional almost human right to grow the plant mm -hmm. and, and it's kind of born out of that and uh, but again in Spain they have you know uh, lots of uh, complexities around the issue. So Portugal where, where do you think it will go next? Will, it, will you ever is it is it any movement to move in help to help out the recreational users and stuff like that? I'm I'm not really sure uh, that we will have the same model as Spain with the social clubs because in Portugal when you talk about social clubs, uh, uh, people think that it's like a, a club where people go to consume drugs and this is not very well seen so people are a bit afraid of uh, of the situation i don't think that we will have that uh, here in portugal uh, maybe what i see now is that all these stores are opening these cannabis stores that sell cbd and uh and these um like products related to cannabis i think that maybe but not sure uh, it will be more like um, a Dutch model with uh, coffee shops or something like that. But anyway, I don't think this will happen. We have to freeze. I'm still quite struck Sorry. by the idea that, um, that uh, society is not so, much so, so cannabis friendly when you're so close to... You froze for a second there, Laura, you're back with us. Okay, yeah. yeah. But I was sorry. just saying that it's a, it's a surprise to me that uh, that there's uh, socially uh, there's not the, there's not so much love for the cannabis user. Mm -hmm. Is what I'm hearing. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't think that the government, um, even though it's uh, quite open, it's uh, a left government right now, uh, left center. Um, but I don't think they are too 
into legalizing for recreational right now. And there was this uh, this party, Bloco uh, de Esquerda. They are from the far left, not not extreme left, but uh, left. And they proposed, uh, they wanted to propose the legalization for recreative uh, purposes. And they presented it last year before the, the pandemic started. They made like an open public discussion about that. And usually when they do this discussion, it's because they are about to present the law, the, the law project to the parliament, but they didn't. And they didn't until today. So it's a little bit strange. Why didn't they present the, the project since they did the public discussion? So we are still waiting on this uh, law to come out and what divides the, the, the parliament, it's the, the right to self grow at home because um, this, uh, this uh, law project, it proposes the legalization with the right to grow at home at two until a number of uh, plants, you know, but all the other parties were against. They, they, the parties from the right, some of them, one, one of them, the biggest one, at least um, many of the deputies, they agree with the legalization. One deputy from the right, they he actually uh, proposed the law mm -hmm. Um, not a law at the parliament, but he presented inside the party a project to um, to legalize for adult use. My kid is on. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, and uh, he was he was um, proposing to legalize for recreational purposes, but without the right to grow at all. Uh, so that's what's dividing uh, the deputies inside the parliament is that many of them agree to legalize uh, recreational cannabis, but not with uh, the right to grow at home. And the party from the left that wants to legalize it, uh, they don't want to uh, quit the right to self-grow. If they presented the project uh, for the law, without the, the right to grow, I'm pretty sure that it would pass and it, it would be legalized, but they, they don't want to quit this right. They really believe in the right to self-grow and they want the, the project of the law to stay like this. Uh, but they didn't present it yet, so nothing happened till today. We okay. don't know when, when they will do it. Sorry Good for the... <laughs> Miriam. Hey, Stephen. So Miriam is at the other extreme of um, she's been through the, the legalization in, uh, in Canada and uh, that's full legalization, Miriam. And yep. uh, so um, can you tell us a little bit about it just to give us a, a broad feel of what is Canada, Canada's legalization look like? Yeah, so I mean, legalization in Canada came in many parts, but I think like uh, when it first came into legalization, like it was just, it was such a night and day difference. So I had kind of been in Canada, first of all, as a medical patient, being able to access the dispensaries. But once everything went legal in Canada for the first year, first of all, overnight, all the local dispensaries got closed down. So what that led to is, you know, a lot of people would have built up relationship with a lot of store owners like we have in Dublin, right? Like people go in and trust the information they're getting about CBD products overnight, that's gone. But the second thing they done is that they only allowed flour and oil into the market. So you had all your RSO oil, your edibles gone. So for the real patients, right? Suffering from real illnesses, it was like, holy shit, guys. And um, the third... Not saying like it's legal in Canada, so that's all good. So I'm just maybe stuff we can learn to make it better if it ever comes in Ireland. So be, when they legalized this, every every single dispensary then had to get a legal license. So overnight, all the dispensaries got shut down. Now it was legal retail stores. What they done in Vancouver, unfortunately, is where I based out of Vancouver mainly. Uh, worked at a national level traveling, but mainly in Vancouver. Overnight, they only had one re legal uh, retail store open in Vancouver. 
So you've gone from having hundreds of stores, right, in one store. Um, so that was a huge issue kind of straight off the bat that they had. Um, but then the quality wasn't quite there either. So you had large scale grows coming into the equation, you know, like the company I worked for, right, Aurora had football fields of grow, but it's all been grown at very average or mids is what we would call it. So the quality wasn't there. Uh, the price had got jacked up and people couldn't visit their local store to get advice on what product they should use. So initially, you know, for the people who are actually consuming cannabis in Canada, it wasn't good. In the grand scale of things, it's brilliant that it's legalized, but like, you know, immediately that was the huge problem is that all these stores got closed overnight. Straight away, the only thing you could buy is flour and oil. So you lost your edibles, your concentrates. So people suffering with cancer, with serious MS, the list goes on didn't have access to their products. So they were still with the black market. And that's really who the biggest competitor was in Canada was the black market because cannabis is, it's part, it's part of the culture in Canada. So, you know, you can't, you can't trick them on the quality. You can't trick them on the price. You know, your neighbor grows down the street. It's, it's just, it's really built into the culture. And um, so that, that was a huge issue and still is a huge issue in Canada. You know, they're finally, starting to cross over with the they call it the black market but really for so much of it it's the legacy market right it's the really top end growers and there is some great quality out there that is now the legal is starting to cross over but you know up until i left which is last july and um, you know the black market was ruling the roost for quality for price uh, and for product so like initially it was like a broad brush stroke that kind of didn't count in the medical interfactor at all. Right. And, and not only that, like then, med so then you separate, you had your legal retail stores like, you know, and like the Sesh store in Dublin, uh, the hemp store overnight, the medical patients now could no longer use that. Now you had to go straight to the producer. So I would either go to my retail store and buy a vape or whatever I'm buying or I have to get a prescription off my doctor, apply to the licensed producer and they'll mail it out to me. So there is no relationship, there's no conversation, right? Like my consult, or not the consultant, it's a doctor over there, you don't need a consultant, just wrote a prescription for X amount of grams. I got mine for a certain producer, so you have a choice in what producer you want. I chose a couple of producers, so that would be on the medical side. And then you had the regular source. So yeah, the medical patients were and still are left high and dry, in my opinion. You know, they aren't being looked after because one thing that's missed about Canada is that it's not recognized as a medicine. So it doesn't have their equivalent of the HBRA numbers here is there something called a DIN. And that basically allows it to be a medicine. So there's huge problems at the moment in Canada for patients who can't afford the medicine because it's not recognized, they can't get on any of the schemes. So everything comes out with your own pocket. Oh, yeah. So it's like it's not that it's perfect. And then, you know, it was only year two then that they allowed in edibles, they allowed in concentrates. But, you know, people had to wait until last year to get that, you know, for a whole year. It was just like, that's a wrap, lads. If you want to buy concentrates or edibles or uh, Rick Simpson oil, you're going to have to go to the black market. How did, how did that happen? Just did it uh, over, was it an overnight 12 o'clock thing that uh, we've legalized? Literally, yeah. And in Vancouver, they didn't, like a lot of the, the old school dispensaries still stayed open. And to this day, there's a couple open. And they didn't go, the police didn't go super hard on us in Vancouver because there's such an opiate problem in Vancouver that they wanted to keep it open. There's, there's not a study in the world that doesn't show that you know, the more access to cannabis you have in an area, the less opiates that are taken, right? Like, so they didn't clamp down as hard uh, on some of the illegal uh, stores that were open until the numbers started building up that you could say, okay, we now have 200 stores in Vancouver, let's let it go. And like, even within, you know, it wasn't even a broad stroke across Canada. In different regions of Canada, it's different rules as well. So you could have, you know, Leinster you're allowed you know x y and z you head over to Connacht and they're like lads no you're not allowed to have pre-rolls for example or you know different things some some provinces only allow you to order online on the recreational front so BC British Columbia is probably the most lax that it's it's pretty open uh, at the moment you can kind of do online deliveries 
you can go into stores, you can buy pretty much any product. So, is there an area where all the grows are focused? Like the big, is there a, a single part of Canada where there all the big grows are keeping this thing going? Yeah, a lot. There's a lot in Alberta, and um, so the a lot in Alberta. BC is more focused on quality. You don't quite get that like large scale football fields of grow. It's more about that organic small craft you know whistler medical marijuana uh, they're grown living organic soil water fed in from glacier you know all the hand trim flower all the good stuff um, and then you do have your large scale grows right and a, lar a lot of them large scale grows are really extracting using it for extraction so they don't quite mind the quality because it's really you, you know you, you just can't it's really hard to grow high quality flower when you have football fields it's just really difficult. You need the room smaller. You need more eyes on the crop, like you know, like like any kind of plant, right? Like you just, it's really difficult to manage that. But what they're doing in the large scale ones, extracting, sticking it in a bottle, you know, they have access. They have the money as well to fund the high end extraction systems. You know, it's not there's nothing special about these people. As grateful as I am to have worked for that company, it's just who has money to buy a hydrocarbon extractor? Who has money to buy a CO2 extractor? We have the farmers in Ireland. That's not an issue. We have the talent. It's just they're not, a you know, every, every day that goes by, we're just a step behind the rest of the world, right? Australia now is starting. It's really starting to get into it. They're starting to do grows in Germany and Norway. It's like, this is, you know, we're all sick to our teeth. And I know it's a bit of an echo chamber here, but like saying to the government, every day that goes by is a day that we're stuck behind uh, industry-wise, you know? We need to develop terroirs, you know? All that stuff. The Canadians are, have got, got into Portugal as well, uh, yeah. Laura. Tilray have a, have a Portuguese kind of subsidiary, I think. Tilray was the, actually the second company that uh, got a license to produce in Portugal back in, I think it was 2014 or 15 around. The first one was uh, GW Pharmaceuticals. And Aurora was actually in Portugal for a couple of years, maybe three years, and they quit last year. They closed the company in Portugal because they took, I don't think this was the only reason, but one of the reasons was because they applied for an authorization from Infarmed. Infarmed is the medicines authority and they applied for uh, an authorization for two of their products. I think it was flowers, both flowers. And they waited for one year and a half and nothing happened. So after that, they just closed the operations in Portugal and Spain, I think, and also Italy, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. And I mean, this, uh, this is, I don't know, till Ray got, just got, Two weeks ago, the first license for uh, flowers, for THC flowers with 18% of THC. And this is the first product approved in Portugal after Sativex. We had Sativex since 2013, um, and it was the only thing cannabis we had. And since two weeks ago, uh, the flowers from Tilray and they are not available yet because the price is not yet defined. It's approved, but uh, they don't have the price yet. So will they, that, will they be sold locally or will they, are they for export? Tilray is, is exporting a lot from Portugal. They are actually importing from Uruguay and from, I think from Canada as well, and then exporting to Germany and to other countries, Israel. Uh, but uh, they are selling absolutely nothing in Portugal yet. I think this is like the Spanish situation. Spanish has massive grows, but nothing is uh, nothing goes to Spanish patients. You know, nothing is uh, goes into the Spanish market. It's, it's been the told. same here, and you know, it's um, it's frustrating for patients because they they do complain a lot because they um, you know, in the social media, uh, when whenever we publish articles or news, they say they always say. 
Well, these big companies uh, came to Portugal to produce and export and for us patients, uh, nothing stays here in Portugal and we are not allowed to grow. So they feel a lot of frustration, especially when they are moms with kids that are uh, suffering or people that are really sick. Um, and they, they feel like abandoned from the, the government because uh, they authorize all these companies. I think at the moment in Portugal, 10 companies got the full license to grow and to uh, import, export everything. But uh, the pre-license, I think I, we, we don't have numbers. Um, I don't have numbers because they never answer these questions, but uh, we believe that more than 30 companies already have pre-licenses to start, you know, building the facilities and all that. So a lot, there's a lot of interest to grow cannabis in Portugal, for sure. Mm. Yeah. So, it's, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, like, it's, it's a, my, my biggest worry, like, I, I, my biggest worry is that we push really hard for a medical, which of course I have a license, a medical, but my big worry is that they go, okay, we're going to do a medical, we're going to allow Tilray, Aurora, Bedrican in, and we're going to do one huge grow like they do in Holland, and that's a wrap, you know, and that could just be the worst thing to happen uh, in Ireland, like when I think of even cannabis tourism, and that's why it's full legalization is what we need, because we need them local terroirs, we need them local grows. And of course we need the medical, but allow an Aurora, a Tilray or whoever else that wants to come in and create, you know, create cannabis as a medicine, you know, and create that exact dosing, that, that cannabis that doesn't have the allergens, that cannabis that is focused on a certain type of illness you know that's that's going to be there regardless it's not like legalization is going to take away from that because they're all chasing the european social care right like they know it's not like canada where you can't afford it you're not getting the medicine you know you come to ireland you're going to probably get a refund when it goes when they bring out the medical access program and that's what a lot of them are chasing it's the shareholders they have to try and make money Whereas if we can get and hold out for the legalization, it can create multiple small grows like the Whistlers of the world, you know, and there's hundreds of other micro grows, you know, a micro license that would allow mm -hmm. Ireland to get a grip on this industry from not only grows, but if you think of like the other companies that will come out of it, like in nurseries, maybe there's companies in Ireland that just create cool genetics that we sell over to California, you know, so there's a nursery, then there's, you know, the flowering and the growing stage and that's the producers but then also companies that focus on extraction and maybe we're the leaders in the world for extracting so if we you know it's all that that comes into the conversation as well and why you know the push for full legalization is so important that allows allows ireland to be part of the full legal that, that allows for all of that and that right to grow as well you know yeah um, and, and, you know, it's, it's what this, you know, with it being based on prohibition as well, like, it's that it's nearly standing up and saying, you know, I'm in my late 30s, lads, like, I'm not, the idea that the government is telling me I can't smoke flour, or I can't grow is off the wall, you know, <laughs> so it's mad, like, I've been for so long. long. <laughs> yeah, we are touching the fundamental rights right there, you know, because it's a human right to grow to grow whatever you want whatever you need mm -hmm. and in, in portugal on the on our constitution uh we have an article that says that uh we have the right uh to uh protect our own health and to decide about our own health there you go. so i think it's even uh, um inconstitutional that you forbid to grow this plant at all so the thing is that in Portugal, there are not many movements or many people pushing uh, to, to get the full legalization, you know, because people are still afraid to admit that they, they consume or they grow at home because they, they, they fear that the police will go there and they will arrest them because, you know, all the time you have this news on the, on the media that says the police, um, uh, caught this man that was growing cannabis at home and you see the the, um, the pictures they published with the news and it was three plants 
tree plants from an old man that was uh, 70 years old. So for sure, he was like making tea or uh, something for his pain, whatever. Self-medicating, you know. self without a doubt. Yeah, so that's uh, very frustrating to see that this still happens uh, in Portugal. And Miriam, you were talking about the uh, um, local investment and uh, small producers. For medical cannabis in Portugal, it will be impossible because you need millions to invest on a medical cannabis company. But uh, we have small investors in EMP and they want to produce CBD, but they are not allowed. Uh, and what happened is that in the last three years, there is a confusion around hemp that until three or four years ago, we had like uh, uh, funds from the European community to grow hemp and to invest on hemp to produce fibers and all these things. And after they legalized medical cannabis, I don't know why, but for some reason this happened. Um, the hemp growers started to be like, um, uh, the, the, the police would go to their farms and destroy all the plantation. And this still happens last year, happened to a lot of farmers. Uh, they, were not, they were not even allowed to start growing because the, the, the Ministry of Agriculture, the department there, they wouldn't, they, they, they wouldn't give the, the license to grow. They refused to certificate the seeds. Um, and so they grew the same. And then the police came and destroyed the majority of uh, the plantations. So the hemp growers are now, are now afraid to grow. There are not many of them growing. Hemp was a, was a very important culture in Portugal since, I don't know, the 14th century. You know, uh, our ships on the discovery were made, the ropes were made out of hemp. Yes. We made many, many things from hemp until some years ago. And then the last years, they, it looks like they, the, they want to finish the hemp growers and they are facing like really serious difficulties. So I think they are trying to avoid this um, local market and local business, which I think it would be the best, you know, because local economy always better than only the big companies, you know, but um, they I are really it's, struggling it's a, right a, now. Absolutely near of Ireland. What you just said there, Laura. I think we've a couple. I can see a couple of. Uh, I know a few names on the on the call here, and they're hemp hemp farmers. And it's like uh, there is a battle in in Ireland at the moment for this uh, kind of the laws around growing. I see him. He's after jumping up there. Thomas O'Connor. He's in the he's in the chat room, but it uh, it is this is a shocking frustration that now appears to be Europe wide. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, they're really struggling. There's no legislation uh, or leadership on this to, be, to get things sorted. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I think it's the CBD market. Everyone yeah. wants the CBD market. It's a huge market. It's uh, thousands of millions of euros or dollars or whatever. And everyone wants to grab this market. So in Portugal, it's uh, CBD. It's now a medicine. You cannot even use it on cosmetics. Uh, without um, the approval of the medicines authority. It's uh, considered a medicine, even though uh, the European Union or the European Commission says uh, you cannot um, uh, forbid the transactions is not a narcotic and you can um, uh, put CBD on the market. In Portugal, they will say, no, 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 no. It's a medicine, only a medicine. And then you go to Lisbon or to Porto or whatever city and you will find many cannabis stores selling CBD. So it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. Well, it's a European wide uh, lack of uh, uh, joined up thinking. And uh, it's, it's so difficult. It, it seems to me every country to find to, to navigate our way through these complexities that should not be there. Come on, it's a plant and let's move to mm -hmm. this, deal with it simply. And that again is why 
I go towards Spain and the model of the clubs, the right to grow, the basic rights that uh, are kind of lived up to in under the Sp Spanish thing. It's still illegal in Spain. Don't get any, anybody get that wrong. And you have people, you've got owners of, uh, of Albert Pio is a very famous uh, campaigner in Barcelona where he's, uh, he's owner of a club and he was threatened with five years in jail. He's after doing 92 days of that five year sentence. He's just out in the last couple of weeks. So it's an incredibly live, live problem, but they've been fighting Catalonia and the Basque country. Funny enough, the two areas that are pretty much the very uh, in the independence chasing kind of areas of Spain are the big leaders. But something that uh, I've heard an awful lot about in Spain is the dynamics of, and I'm wondering about it affecting Portugal, the dynamic of, of the, the North and the South, because there's so much criminality uh, hanging around the south of Spain, around the Costa del Sol, and it stretches into the Algarve. And I'm wondering, is that part of the kind of uh, the bad, the bad impression on the on the Portuguese public towards towards cannabis? That there's a lot of criminality on the south because of the proximity to Morocco, but generally the proximity to uh, the criminality basing themselves on, on the south of the Iberian Peninsula. Well, I'm not sure about that. Um, I, I, I'm really not into that. Uh, maybe it's drugs have come. Maybe there are more uh, operations uh, in the south in Algarve, but um, I, I'm really not uh, aware of that. It could be. It could be possible. Yeah. It's a, I think it's a factor in Spain anyway, that, uh, that, well, the criminality. So while we have this situation of the club's right to grow, we have these, uh, di there is these different uh, kind of pluses to this, to this Spanish kind of club model. And they are starting clubs in, uh, those clubs are being Uruguay, who went legal, fully legal, like Canada. And, uh, but they are now creating clubs. So they're seen as a kind of transition between the full kind of legislating that needs to be done through the complex kind of issues that there are, you kind of, this clubs is like a, a halfway house that to, uh, to allow people, to allow the, the patients to still access, to allow people to grow and to, and so the kind of human rights to grow and things like that. And so it's a kind of halfway house. There are, there are uh, clubs in Belgium Switzerland, I think you've got clubs now. And so they're, they're peppering up all around, uh, all around Europe. Holland, that had, was fam so famous for the coffee shops for years and years, they're even kind of, uh, like they're pulling back from that because of the, the you know, it's moving, it was, it was the black market was kind of feeding those coffee shops for so long. So now they want to get a handle on it. So they're looking at this idea of the non for, because it's not for profit, it's not for uh, like everybody that is regulated, everybody who runs a, co a, 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 a cannabis club has to be kind of regulated. And so it's, a, it's only a question of enforcement. The idea is you, you're only served enough, uh, enough cannabis to consume inside the club. Once you go out, you, it's illegal. You can, there's a kind of an allowance of a little bit mm -hmm. that you can do to get in between the club and, and getting it home. But technically, going out onto the street and puffing and 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 smoking what you bought inside in the sh in, inside in the club is not allowed. That's illegal. And uh, so the it, the kind of fundamentals of the cannabis uh, clubs in Spain, the fundamentals of the allowing allowing people, giving people access to the right to grow, giving people access to up, uh, come together as an association and operate like that. I think is it's, for me. It's still, uh, it's, while it's a halfway house in Ireland, our legislators, you know, I think it'll take them so long to, to navigate their way through the kind of complexities of legalization. I'll throw this back to Miriam. Will they ever manage that? And would, would we not be better pursuing the kind of halfway house of the clubs and the right to grow? That's my piece. <laughs> yeah. Um, like when we speak about criminality, like that's really the big push for legalization you know and i think as part of this whatever happens is that we're going to have to create a cannabis amnesty as well and one of the reasons it got through in canada one of the big reasons justin trudeau pushed for legalization is that his brother got caught with some weed 
And of course, his dad at the time was, I think he was prime minister or something, but he recognized and was honest enough to be like, yeah, my brother got sorted because of who my dad was. And why is it fair that there's, you know, thousands and thousands of people who didn't get sorted? And that was, that had a big impression on him. And I think like, you know, little steps we can take is, you know, we know Simon Donnelly, for example, has consumed cannabis. Well, why is it one reel for him and a different reel for us? You know, why? So it's touch and base as well and pushing that and, you know, questioning our TDs and questioning our local councillors and saying, well, we need the same rules for everybody here and the opportunities that are being missed by people having a criminal conviction. And I know for me, my, I wouldn't have been able to go to Canada. It's huge. Like if I had a criminal conviction, my life changes forever. You know, and why am I, why am I able to travel? I consume cannabis illegally, you know, back in the day and other people are caught and the destruction it's having. And it's really educating and showing people that the problems cannabis is having with prohibition, right? Like, but do I think we'll get there? Yeah, I do. I really do. I think it's coming. Do you yeah. like the idea of the clubs? <laughs> I do. I like it as part as part of it, right? Like I like it as part of the community social club, right? Because we are also going to need the Budweisers or the Auroras of the world to create the medicine with the exact dose. Yeah. And, but then we need the social clubs for education, for local quality, mm -hmm. for local business, you know? So they're vital part uh, of cannabis going legal in Ireland because we'll all need to mind it and make sure that, you know, our friend, we're not handing our friend you know, a joint, a full joint for his first time or her first time, you know, like we, exactly. everybody on this call is kind of like an ambassador, you know, whether like it or not. So it's up to us, you know, I've seen some chat about coming out of the closet, like coming out of the closet is also minding your friends when you introduce them to cannabis. It's being that person at the dinner table that discusses it with your family. You know, you having a discussion with four or five people over a six month period versus sharing a post is huge, you know, and they're just little steps kind of that we can do to continue to build. You know? one, of the, one of the theories behind the clubs is that uh, everybody is on an invite. So it's mm. only for, it, they're designed for cannabis users. So when, yeah. when you take it as what it is and forget about, look, they do get abused and there will be laundering and there will be different things that run through them and uh, criminality will kind of eschew. The, but the foundations of the model are, uh, are essentially good. They're designed that uh, people can only, you only consume uh, a level in, because you're, you're supposed to only consume on the thing. When, you, when you're outside, you're, you, the, the cannabis that's grown for that club doesn't go into the black market out, outside the doors. And uh, you basically, if you're a young guy, you can only consume what you can buy inside, which is kind of controlled. And, yeah. uh, and it's all got the same kind of quality controls and things that you have with I would imagine inside uh, in Canada and in, in your dispensaries in Canada. And it's just, it's all about safety, right? Like that's really why we all want cannabis legal as well is that we, we all want it in a safe environment. We want, you know, we want the first time someone's going into a store to be able to speak to somebody and say, well, you know, maybe you're trying a high CBD today for your first time. And maybe you're trying one pull through a vaporizer or whatever it is, you know, and it's just everything about full legalization for cannabis is about safety. You know, and about mm -hmm. taking uh, taking it away from uh, the criminals. And there's ways of tweaking that with social clubs, right? Like we take, we learn from different countries around the world. I'm not saying Canada is the way to go, but they do a 30 year history if you want to open a store. You know, maybe we go similar to how we do it with the pubs here that the guards would sign off that that person is in good standing. Because there's issues in Canada with uh, the biker gangs. So they all tried to get into it too. And there's areas we couldn't go into as reps. Um, so that's, you know, that's a thing as well. And that's going to be a big thing. Yeah, this is the regulating of the thing. So the regulating mm -hmm. is something that kind of comes with anything. Mm -hmm. You know, you're kind of, you, you create the laws and you create the, the set the, the law enforcement of the laws around the regulations. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think and everybody somehow is, gets protected. So uh, we're, get, we're just uh, um, conscious of Laura's time because I think you have to head off. But um, so what do you think, Laura? Do you've, what, what I feel is that Portugal has done very well in recognizing the health, turning, you know, recognizing the addicts being, uh, being a health problem and a health issue and not being, uh, you know, not being a kind of, we shouldn't be feeling sorry for addicts type of thing, but you haven't stepped over to the cannabis. That's a surprise to me. I didn't know it was like that. 
Yeah, there's there's still a lot of prejudice uh, as far as I'm concerned, and um, but I, I really think that I, I'm more into the the social club and the the um, the place where growers uh, grow together, as in Spain, more than into the Dutch model with coffee shops, because you know in uh, in Holland uh, the cannabis the, it's it's also forbidden to, I don't know exactly how it works, but I know that uh, the producers that produce the cannabis, they cannot transport the cannabis to the coffee shops. It's yeah. something like that. And it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it happens like magic, how the cannabis get, get into the coffee shops. So I, I think the I've social- I've that way for 20 years, 20, 30 years. It, it is, it is. Also, like also in Spain, it's not very clear on the law that social clubs are allowed. It actually, I think, it happens uh, on a void on the on on the law. It's not exactly regulated, but I think the, this model of the of the clubs, uh, where people grow to others and they share their surplus, and uh, I think it's very interesting this model because they people can join together and can get together to grow together and to grow for others, not only for themselves, but for others that are in need. So hopefully in Portugal, we will go that way. But I, I don't see this um, very easy. And I was reading here on the comments, uh, someone saying that uh, about the hemp situation, that it was the same in Ireland, that uh, Charlene was saying that, uh, uh, here we haven't given out a hemp license since 2017 either. So this makes me curious, like, uh, why is this happening <laughs> all over Europe? Why are they like uh, blocking the hemp production? And this, is, this has to be about hemp, about uh, the CBD market. Uh, big, big pharma, for sure, they are placing uh, the companies to get the, the biggest CBD market, market for sure. Because in Portugal, if you grow hemp, um, you cannot uh, grow, you cannot have the flowers. You can only make fibers, there you go. not the flowers and not the oils. You cannot extract oils from the flowers. And this is what we need to change. Uh, not only with hemp, but also with uh, with cannabis in uh, everything about cannabis. I mean, uh, people need to know that cannabis is not going to kill anyone. Never so has. Why not grow at home? And they in Portugal, they will say, oh, because now cannabis has uh, very high THC levels. And who is going to assure that it's not contaminated or... Uh, they, it doesn't have heavy metals and uh, all that stuff. I mean, it's uh, if you grow at home, you know what you are growing. And if you're growing for yourself, you won't put contaminants there, right? So, I'm going to come in on uh, that, Miriam. You're an expert grower. Is it possible for us to grow at home <laughs> safely? Uh, yeah, you know, absolutely. You know, like all this is possible, like, you know, like, and we shouldn't even apo not apologize for it, but like grow at home, social clubs, you know, small local grows and the bigger grows. Like it's this, it has to be kind of all in from my point of view anyway. Um, but the right to grow at home is huge, especially for chronic pain, you know, especially for chronic mm -hmm. pain people. Like I do not, I need certain varieties and I need to mix them up as well. I barely use Bedrican at the moment because it's the same strain since last, since I got home last July, or I got it in June. Nonsense, like, you know what I mean? It's actually bad, public health wise, it's even bad. So that's why it's key for the growth at home and the price of cannabis as well. Like you're able to keep your cannabis down. And then maybe, yes, I go to the store, I organize off, I order off the producer if I want exact dosing in my capsules, right? I can't make them at home or I want X, Y, and Z, but, you know, rosin clubs will get created. I was part of a rosin club, right? Every Friday I'd meet, we'd meet up, we'd all bring our flour, there'd be a rosin pressing machine, we'd press it out into a concentrate. And it was this cool social, all learning about different grow types. And that's why I say about full legalization, because then it all becomes about who's the grower. 
oh, but maybe I want some wild Atlantic, you know, grown in bog and you're set, you know, you're coming and you're coming with all them details of the grow, you know, and it, it just creates a community and it's, it's an art, you know, like a lot of them dab rigs are 10, 12, 20,000. And it's really like nearly people that make their own whiskey, right? Like you start creating that kind of terroir of areas of grows in Ireland. Um, so yeah. Our, our countries are small. So, I mean, this is, it should it's be- It's the whole thing to be a terroir, right? So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it should be uh, it should be the focus for us for to create the with communities within our small enough community you know yeah and share genetics and share knowledge you know and uh, also just there in, oh. in canada there is this uh, figure of the caregiver right that you can grow for other yeah. people yeah and this is also interesting you know because when you have like um more of older people that are not in the position that they know how to grow or they they have the space to grow um it's also interesting that we think about uh, this figure of a caregiver um it's not a caregiver what's the name they they give to this uh, person that grows for other people that cannot grow it's not caregiver it's you know it's, yeah Care. I'm not sure the exact term they use in Canada, but I, I, I call them, yeah, caregivers, they're caregivers. Yeah, they're but this, is, this would be also interesting to have in the new models to come, that uh, mm -hmm. some people are allowed, it could be a social club that, that would solve this problem, yep. you know, but that you can grow for people that can't. Or that are not they, they don't they don't have the the talent to grow because it's not easy to grow cannabis. Mm -hmm. Once I tried and I killed all the plants in the beginning, they were, I know that. They were like super pretty in the beginning when they were like this, and then they died. Why? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but then if we had yeah. clubs where we could go and learn, wouldn't that be exactly. so amazing? Exactly. And different farmers from Ireland with their different experiences and we create our own genetics and yeah and to, and to just Laura to put you in the uh, over this series of talks we've had different talks we've had me I have MS and in the beginning we did MS we did condition by condition and so uh, Miriam would have been on a, on a chronic pain thing and had like the usual kind of bad experience with prescribed drugs and mm -hmm. went on and then we had Kenny Tynan who's also on the call here and Kenny's been down the cancer road quite uh, quite serious cancer patient and so but like um what for me it's um that uh, what we had along the way was we had uh, we had a remarkable two remarkable mothers of ep epileptic children pediatric uh, epilepsy and you know they like uh, Vera Toomey kind of would turn around she said they said look at I don't, I don't want to ever have to grow anything, you know, and that's, and that's what she needs for her kids. She needs the kind of pharma, the exact kind mm -hmm. of there's, so there's a place for everything for, uh, for all, every condition can be serviced. It, it, all the endocannabinoid systems are there to be tweaked and to be triggered by different cannabinoids. And we only get to that situation when we have a, an open kind of conversation where it's not, it removes prohibition out of the way. That's my opinion. And, but Vera yeah. certainly, uh, you know, emphasized that point that, you know, I couldn't care less about the right to, about the right to grow really, because I want my kid to get her medicine and that's fair enough. Sure. So, so it is a bit, it's a, it's a very broad issue. Have, will we go, Linda, we'll have a look at the, um, so they get, let the, the girls have, do we have questions in our chat, let's say that we could put to the girls? We have we only have a couple of questions, which I'll get to, but it, 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 there's been interesting conversations going on in the chat and there's a common theme. There's three common themes like everybody's just in awe of what the girls are saying. Like we could listen to you all, all night because you're such a fountain of knowledge and we've so much to learn. The three common things that are coming through on the comments are we want small local protect, protection um, or small local production. We want to protect our indigenous businesses and growers. We want the right to grow. That's the biggest thing. We want the right to grow, the right to grow. And of course, Martin's call for civil disobedience. It's always there. Um, <laughs> Good <man>, Martin. <laughs> two questions. They both came from Ashley. And the first one was um, towards the start of your talk, um, Laura. Um, somebody was wondering, Ashley was wondering, do they give heroin to heroin addicts when they are being treated? I presume that's opposed to here, you would give methadone instead of heroin. 
Yeah, I saw this one. I I I don't think I can reply. So I uh, the, and then there were so many questions I couldn't uh, uh, write while I talk. While I talk, so um, I don't think so. I think that they give uh, methadone instead of heroin, so they will quit heroin uh, to uh, continue on methadone. But what they what they are giving as well is like benzodiazepines. Uh, like uh, to for the anxiety they get of the withdrawal of heroin um, and then they get addicted to all these uh, other substances like these opioids and uh, benzodiazepines which is not good um, so I don't know what's worse really yeah that, that's interesting because I think in Ireland like you just get people who are just addicted to government provided methadone as opposed to helped with their actual addiction and I always thought it would be better in Portugal but obviously not mm. um okay uh, the other question we had was from Miriam and it was actually again asking is it easier to get licenses in Canada now I think that's in reference to trying to get a license to have your own um dispensary uh so Maybe she can clarify. So to get a medical license, yes, super easy. You know. uh, no, like you were saying, when they legalized the next morning, all the CBD shops had closed and they had to uh, apply for oh, licenses oh. to have their shop or whatever is it. And did they open that up? Yeah, so it's, it is still really difficult. It's not an easy thing to get a license. Um, and to give you an idea, like even with Vancouver, how difficult it is to get in. The general council license so if you open a store the council will normally charge any retail store because it's retail now uh three thousand uh canadian dollars if you own a cannabis store before you open your doors you got to pay the council 30 grand plus it, they do a serious background check like it's i think it's as far as i know it's 30 years background check and then a 25 year financial check on top of that as well so the barriers are up to get in and um, we're starting to see some of the legacy and the legacy would be what were some of the older stores that were open uh, before legalization. So some of the OG stores, people that, you know, really their local store, they're starting to get back in with huge barriers financially to get in. And that's one thing we would need to look at is to lower them barriers so that it's easier for Irish companies to get in because you legalize in Ireland, you'll have all this money flowing in and it will be just like any other commodity, you know, there'd be a rake of Circle K cannabis stores, right? Like they'll have the money to come in. Um, so that would be a big thing that we need to ensure that we don't have them huge barriers. And um, that's, you know, th the right people are opening the stores too. And that's important for education and how cannabis is given long term. So we want the right educators and the right people in it. If that answers this. Okay, that's all we had in the um, in the chat. Thanks very much. They were all our questions, as I say. And there's lots of conversation going on there about um, the hemp licenses, but uh, maybe that's something we can touch on another time. We have a couple of farmers, Laura, in the in the in the chat. I've seen. Uh, so look at Matt. I want to just. I have uh, total support for them, you know, because here in Portugal, Portugal, they struggle a lot. Yeah. They they used to go to Infarmed to this medicines authority to ask can we grow hemp? And they would say, oh, it's not with us. You need to go to the Ministry of Agriculture. And they would go to the Ministry of Agriculture and say, oh, it's not with us, it's with Infarmed. So they, are, they would feel like a ping pong ball going from one place to another and getting no answers at all from, and they would come like from the North uh, on a purpose to Lisbon just to solve these uh, issues. And they would go back with no answers and no answers. So. Um, I think this is uh, outrageous. This shouldn't happen, never, because uh, there is such a potential on hemp to do anything like from bioplastics to fibers to cosmetics to oils to medicines to whatever. You can do so many things from hempcrete uh, to the natural building. Uh, so why are we blocking this culture? And then you, you see the police um, that goes after these little farmers. And there, there was the, this, this uh, guy was growing a big, big plantation of hemp. He had like, I think it was um, 30,000 plants or something like that. 
uh, and the police went there and destroyed everything. And on the news, uh, they, uh, the police was very uh, happy because they found the second biggest cannabis illegal, illegal plantation of Europe. It was the second biggest of Europe. In Portugal, uh, you know, we like to be the biggest in uh, everything because we are small. <laughs> Except the Eurovision. And then uh, the police, they cannot tell the difference fr from hemp and cannabis. And it's so stupid that they were saying it was the second biggest cannabis plantation and it was hemp, it was not cannabis. Uh, and then at the same time, like two weeks after, there was a robbery uh, with guns in a hemp plantation. But since they had security and it was like this big assault, uh, they put it on the news. There was this robbery on a medical cannabis plantation and it was not medical cannabis, it was hemp. So <laughs> they are always making this confusion with hemp and cannabis. They cannot tell the difference. So I, I mean. I think we need also to educate uh, not only journalists, uh, but also uh, police, uh, the, the police people, because I mean, they, they need a lot of education. Well, it's a, good, uh, it's a good way to wrap the conversation just to, and tell people exactly about your, people can read about, read you in the, what is it, the Canna Reporter? Uh, it's cannareporter.eu. Uh, and uh, it's in or the original language, it's in uh, Portuguese, but we have a very nice plugin that translates into English. It's an automatic translation, but it's quite accurate. It's uh, not bad at all. Okay, and, uh, and it's very current because I've been reading, reading a little bit. And, uh, and then I just want to uh, bring attention to everybody for tomorrow is in Spain, there's a massive uh, Congress in, uh, in a congresso, I have to think I should know it off the top of my head, but there's a very big Congress because they're trying to kind of push for movement in uh, the kind of legality and the situation in Spain, which is not, not great. There's a lot of bad press around uh, the criminality that's kind of settled into the, the mafia, mafias and different things that are beginning to uh, eschew the narrative of, uh, of the Spanish, uh, the good things in the Spanish system. And uh, so that's that's a big Congress tomorrow. It's online Congress, so I forget what it is, but it's a European body actually. And uh, but it's on tomorrow. If, if anybody wants to, I'll I'll put it up, I'll put it up in a tweet or something afterwards. Yeah. And uh, Miriam, what's you? Have you got any plans that we'll tell the people about? No, not yet. Hopefully, coming soon. But a bit of luck. <laughs> There you go. Well, we'll cross our fingers and look forward to hearing because I know I kind of know a little bit in the background and uh, really looking forward to see what uh, because I think uh, we're so lucky to have you, uh, Miriam, because I think uh, you're an official sommelier. We don't have many. I don't think are you the Ireland's only sommelier? <laughs> no, God, I'd say there's a lot more who just aren't quite, who haven't got the cert, maybe. Yeah, there you <laughs> yeah. go. That's I just got the cert. That's all. <laughs> Look, it's been a pleasure, ladies. And, uh, I mean, and can I, I just add one thing? I forgot that one. maybe some of you could be interested on uh, PTMC, Portugal Medical Cannabis. What we usually do since the pandemic, we do events online and we are having uh, one on the 26th, uh, February 26th at 5 p.m. with uh, Christina Sanchez and Daddy Mary and Janos Kratz and some doctors and researchers and lawyers that will discuss uh, medical cannabis. And it will be on a digital platform with avatars where you create your little own avatar uh, and you go into this virtual platform. It's very amusing because uh, you will see like Christina Sanchez in a little uh, doll, but then she will appear on the screen and it's the same voice and it's her, uh, and at the end you can dance. So we made uh, some events last year that were quite amusing. So if you wanna join us, it will be on uh, February the 26th. Yeah. I'll post all this stuff out on my social media and, uh, and uh, you know, let's be, but do, to, on a positive note, Laura, do you see, can we be positive? Will we see change? 
Oh, sure, for sure. We need to stay positive. I mean, so many bad things happening already. We need to focus and stay positive and uh, believe in uh, and defend our rights. Yeah. And that's what I will do. I will uh, stand by the, uh, at least from the, the patient's rights, because the, I see that are the people that suffer the most because they are already sick or their kids are sick and they really need support and they really need someone to stand for them and to uh, support them achieving all these uh, goals. So if I will do something in the future is to bring more information and to break this stigma and this prejudice and that people get more education, more knowledge, so all these people can get their medicines as soon as possible. We need a good, honest press like you in Ireland, I think. It's something that we're... Uh, <laughs> We're absolutely like lacking is uh, no, but I think it's vital. You know, press is uh, is still a vital cog in this uh, in the in this movement, and uh, mm -hmm. so we gotta we gotta get stuck into our Irish press representatives to step up to the plate because I, I can see what you're doing down uh, down there for the patients and creating the conferences and all of that. And it's all great. You're looking at two patients here, by the way, Laura. You know, so uh, this is uh, and we're all here. You know, to try and uh, uh, you know progress uh, our lives, and by reflection, everybody that we know. And uh, so, thank you. I'm going to I'm going to wrap it up, guys. And uh, Laura, thanks for staying <laughs> with us so long as well. You told thank me you. Have to and I can hear your kids. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. Ah, so look, much. it's great. It's wonderful. To I have. can I can leave you the the link on the chat. I can put the link for the documentary of the patients I did here in Portugal. It has subtitles in English if you want to watch. There you go. Let me just grab the link to put it here. And if people stay on the chat there for a little little while longer, I'm going to put up the um, I'm going to put up that that big massive Spanish con it's at Congress, but it's in um, I can't can I do that? Kind of course, and it's in uh, but it's in Spanish, which I'm sure you can handle, uh, Laura. It's the observe it. This is a but this is a, a European can a European Congresso. It's in it'll be I don't know how Spanish how much in Spanish it's going to be. There's some kind of English speakers and things like that. The full lineup is there, but it's going to be very interesting. And, and uh, in Spain, there's a bit of a uh, there's a real feel that it's time to sort out this. But we've got problems here, man. They're 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 jailing they're jailing rappers in Spain for uh, calling them terrorists for uh, rapping about rapping about a corrupt crown that 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 goes to Africa to shoot elephants. And uh, oh, so there's a long way to go in all our politics. My God. <laughs> yeah. So you could dose them all with edibles. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, guys, and thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Laura, uh, and uh, we'll you. Let, you let you back to your life. <laughs> Thank you. Go back to the kids. Yeah, the kids. <laughs> yeah okay, we can hear them in the background there. So, obrigado. Thank you, uh, Linda, the lovely Linda, for looking after the chat room and uh, and keeping my back, room my back. <laughs> So thank you so much, Linda, and look, we'll see you all again next week when we when we deal with Irish uh, legislation, where we've got two two of our legal eagles and uh, who are direct camp who got a direct looking at the campaign uh, via their PhDs, and uh, and we need them now, and because Ireland has this mad situation with Little Collins and uh, and these and this thing of getting pe seasoned people. I think I'm going to leave you with the last thing, Laura. There's a very famous, I don't know if you know, Blind Boy, this uh, no. guy from the Rubber Bandits. He's got one of the uh, one of the biggest kind of podcasts in the world at this stage. And, Blind uh, Boy. Blind Boy. He wears, a, he wears okay. a plastic bag on his head, but he came out with the most, uh, the, the kind of, the one sentence that framed it all was it's uh, the police going into the Little Collins uh, CBD uh, shop was like the cops going into a bar and, and seizing all the Heineken Zero. So all the alcohol free beer, you know, that's the same. <laughs> it's the same, uh, exact same narrative. It's shocking. So we, we're going to be following up and that's what we're doing next week with uh, two of our own Irish legal eagles. <laughs> so hope Nice, see you. I will try to join you. Yeah, look, it'd be good. Thanks a lot again for coming. I'm going to stop thanking and I'm going to 
disappear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Miriam, as well. Thanks, Thank Sarah. you, Linda. Bye. Thank you, Steven. Bye-bye. Bye, all. Bye. 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 Bye.